The church's persecution of Galilee through its proposition of a heliocentric universe is just a typical example of organised religion trying to hinder the progression of science. Despite the fact that I'm a Catholic myself, I believe that the persecution of Galileo was a shameful episode in the church's history. I don't think religions necessarily try and hinder scientific developments, but let's just say they don't exactly help. Science is willing to change its views based on observations. Faith requires you to ignore these observations to preserve tradition. Believers are constantly being forced to rethink their position as science keeps making new discoveries and catching them out. There is absolutely no conflict between science and religion because they deal with different questions. Religion deals with why, science deals with how. Although science does provide us with facts, it doesn't necessarily improve life. I think that it's spiritual thought that enhances the mind. Religion you have in one hand and then you have science in the other hand. They're two far apart worlds, but they have something to offer each other. Well, let's begin with Galileo. As I'm sure you know, he supported the idea that it was the Earth that went round the Sun rather than the other way round. He presented the arguments for and against the theory in a book entitled Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems. No sooner did the book appear, then he was put on trial by the church. He was forced to recant. On his knees, he had to declare, I abjure, curse and detest the false doctrine that the sun is the centre of the world and immovable, and that the earth is not the centre and moves. As Sinead said, Despite the fact that I'm a Catholic myself, I believe that the persecution of Galileo was a shameful episode in the church's history. Alexandra went further. The church's persecution of Galileo through its proposition of a heliocentric universe is just a typical example of organised religion trying to hinder the progression of science. But is that justified? Taking a closer look, what we find is that the Pope himself, Urban VIII, who'd actually encouraged Galileo to write his book. He even asked Galileo to include an argument of his own in it. Not only that, but the book had passed the church censors. So what went wrong? The trouble appears to lie with the way Galileo handled the argument put forward by the Pope. The argument was that God is all-powerful, so he could make it look as though the Earth was going round the sun, as in point of fact, it was the sun going round the earth. Galileo mercilessly tore this argument to shreds, having made it clear that it had come from the Pope himself. Which wasn't very sensible. Pope Urban VIII wasn't someone you messed around with. Years later, Galileo wrote in a letter I hear from Rome that His Eminence Cardinal Antonio and the French Ambassador have spoken to His Holiness and attempted to convince him that I never had any intention of committing so sacrilegious an act as to make fun of His Holiness, as my malicious foes have persuaded him, and which was the major cause of all my troubles. Which was the major cause of all my troubles? Now, there we have it, from the mouth of Galileo himself. So, you know, forget all this big science versus religion confrontation. It was a petty squabble. If Galileo had been more tactful, none of it would have happened. Nevertheless, it has to be said that, you know, putting all that aside, for many people, like Alexandra, the relationship between science and religion is one of conflict. And it's not difficult to see why. In the first place, there's been the practice among some religious believers of trying to convince others of the need for a god by pointing to gaps in knowledge and saying, ha ha, science can't explain that. Why? Because God's doing that. Thunder and lightning, manifestations of God's wrath. That sort of thing. Life. Scientists can't create life. That's a special gift from God. It was Rachel who 
put her finger on the problem with that kind of an argument. Believers are constantly being forced to rethink their position as science keeps making new discoveries and catching them out. Another potential source of conflict is if one insists on taking a literal approach to the writings of Genesis, as creationists do. That puts you on a collision course with science. But is conflict inevitable? You know, what, what of other ways of viewing the relationship between science and religion? There is absolutely no conflict between science and religion because they deal with different questions. Religion deals with why, science deals with how. Two separate enterprises, each dealing with a separate domain of understanding. You want to know how the world came into existence, the mechanics of the Big Bang? You look to science. You want to know why there is a world and what's the point of it? You look to religion. How did life evolve? Science. What is the ultimate purpose of life? Religion. A third approach is offered by Charles. Religion you have in one hand and then you have science in the other hand. They're two far apart worlds, but they have something to offer each other. In other words, they are not completely separate. There are points of contact. Sometimes they have something relevant to say to each other. For example, we've seen how through genetically influenced behaviour patterns we might expect humans from the moment of conception to have a tendency to be selfish. But actually the Adam and Eve story, the part about the taking of the forbidden fruit, that was already making the same point that we, that we have an inborn tendency to be self-centred, disobedient to God, what religious people call original sin. And we've seen how, long before Darwin, St. Augustine had the, the rudiments of an idea about evolution. He also anticipated the idea of there being no time before the world was created. So th th these were examples of religion taking the lead, offering insights. In the other direction, we have seen how, for example, science prompts religious people to reconsider the, the clear-cut distinction traditionally made between humans and animals, in the light of how we seamlessly evolved from lower forms of life. There is also the challenge of thinking about extraterrestrial intelligence. How is that supposed to fit into God's plan? So science has insights to offer religion, and sometimes it's the other way around. So when it comes to relationships between science and religious belief, we have so far three models. The conflict model, the independence model, and what we might call the interaction model. Finally, there is the integration model. This is where we see science and religion engaged jointly in a common search for understanding. About 30 years after the Galileo scandal, the Royal Society in London was formed. It became the leading scientific organisation in the United Kingdom. And prominent amongst its early membership were clergy. Its first chairman was Bishop John Wilkins. A later president of the Royal Society was Sir Isaac Newton probably the greatest scientist of all time. In his lifetime, Newton wrote four million words on theology. For him and, and many others, both then and now, it seems only natural that a study of God should lead to a study of God's creation. A religious outlook on life leading to an interest in science, all in a perfectly natural way. They are integrated. So there we have it, four different ways of viewing the relationships between science and belief. Which of these alternatives you decide to go for is of course up to you.